Welcome to the Be Your Own Answer podcast, empowering good people like you to amplify your voice, your message, your movement. We believe that when 10,000 uncommon leaders step into high-level platforms, we will transform and heal communities across the planet. It's time to be your own answer. And now your host, Narissa Street. Hi there. Hey there. Ho there. How you doing? So, so excited that you all are with us and that you are tuned into the podcast. You know which podcast it is. It's our podcast. It's a podcast where we get to be very incredible women who are amplifying their voices and their missions so that they can be the answer in their communities. My name is Marissa Street, as you heard. And I am so excited to bring to you today the incomparable Whitney Lubin. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Whitney, they don't know what I know about you, but they are going to learn this about you. So tell us who you are. So my name is Whitney Lubin. I'm based in South Florida, uh, Broward County specifically, born and raised. So I'm I'm definitely a a local uh, Floridian. um, And I'm I'm first generation Haitian American. Um, I grew up in South Florida. Uh, My background is like intact, but it's not something I really saw myself in as like a profession until very recently, like I was always obsessed with tech and I was very much so like an early adopter and like a, a hacker breaker of things, trying to solve um, problems using whatever tools were around me. And so um, when I went to university, um, I did what like probably every Haitian uh, child first generation would do. I majored in biological sciences. I was like a pre-med major basically um, with the intention of becoming a doctor because the only fields your parents kind of like talk to you about is like being a doctor, being an attorney or an engineer. (laughs) So, um, and so I really got a chance to try out all paths (laughs) before I actually found the place for myself. So um, switched my major, went international affairs, um, thought about going to law school, applied. Um, and then, I mean, I knew from the get-go that I had like this entrepreneurial spirit and that it was driven by like the technologies and tools that were, were around me and how I could use those to facilitate change and and just like um, create the things that I wanted to create. And so um, I scraped that idea and I just decided to just go headlong into entrepreneurship. Um, and I wanted to focus primarily in technology, like how that drove innovation and, um, you know, growth and scale for businesses. Uh, In the process, um, you know, there are just different things that I'm passionate about, community oriented things uh, that came about in my journey that I've just, they kind of fell in my lap, but it's more so like, I knew like where I, I knew what my talent was. And my talent is that I love scaling solutions. I love looking at problems and building from there and collaborating with people in the process. And so a lot of the problems that I've taken an entrepreneurial kind of like angle at, um, I'm able to do all that. You know, I'm able to solve the problem, work, collaborate with others and have an impact in the communities that I care about. And so that's kind of basically my background. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in the in the middle, but I think we'll just kind of like go into that throughout the, the interview. <laughs> so, so, so much to, to chew on and excited to hear that. So going from solving problems with tools, and I think um, every entrepreneur, if, if you've, if you've uh, taken any kind of entrepreneurial class, is the first, first 101, day one, they talk about being an entrepreneur is about solving problems. So... The, what I heard a little bit more of with you, and especially thinking about the fact that you majored in international relations, like that was when you decided, hey, you know what, med school, fine, but this is really where my heart is. The, the thought about solving problems on a scalable rate, you know, so that you could really impact the community is really interesting to dive into. So how has your academic focus with international affairs blended into your entrepreneurial focus of technology? 
Oh, you know, that's a very good question. That's something that I've never really been asked. Um, but I think there is an element of like, so for me, when I made that switch of like biology, it was organic chem, organic chem kind of just like, I was just like, oh, oh no, I can't stay on this track. But I've always been the type of, (laughs) I've been the type of person, like, I just like to dive deeper in the areas that, that interest me. And for a long time, the sciences interested me and I just, I, I had an appetite for it. But another area I had an appetite for was understanding like the geopolitical like structure of things and how other people live their lives. Uh, we live in the U.S. and we're used to like this system of things, right? Um, the government, the form of government. Um, and of course, it has its own ch- things that have changed over time. But I've always had a curiosity about how other communities, how they live and how their governments operate, how their societies operate um, and how some things may work for their community and may not work for another. And so I think for me, it was about understanding like these different forms of government and how they can work for one group of people. Um, I think because we live in a democracy uh, or we live in the United States and in a, in a certain type of democracy, we think it's the mechanism that will work for everyone. And that's what America advertises. Um, But what I learned is like, there's different ways of executing that type of, democratic model it's they don't all look the same it's not one size fits all and so that's what i love and that's the reason why i went into that space because it allowed me to get to know not only like the history the culture but just like the idea of how things evolve and why they evolved um the history the history of things that create a circumstance where um a certain structure exists today and it and that i think is a lot of what technology is um sometimes the best solution for one person is not the best solution for another community. Um, And technology, and we can go this into later into some of the projects I've worked in, but sometimes it's not the fanciest technology that actually works. You have to meet the people where they're, where they are, and then you create a solution that's scalable from that point, not you know, not a solution that might be more so 10 years down the line, but something that in that moment they can implement and creates great impact. And so um, I think that's really the tie-in of the international affairs is it, it was very people oriented, understand people, their histories. And especially since we live in like, I would say, a, yeah, a melting pot, the, the U S like there's just so many cultures. And so there's so many possible problems to be solved. Right. Right. And I, I, I love that you're able to to parse that out because I think a lot of people feel that technology has to be the shiniest tool as opposed to the most useful tool. Right. And so what I'm hearing is that the the opportunity to study international affairs also gave you an understanding of the data that is necessary in order to craft a solution that makes sense for whoever the market is. So then let's talk a little bit more about that and talk about now how then governments, you know, because one of the things you talked about is is how specific types of government work for specific types of people, cultures, histories, things like that. So then how then with that mindset, can governments start to serve their people using the technology that's in front of them? That's a really good question. And I think um, this is something that, yeah, they're definitely struggling with. Um, And so so one of the projects I worked with uh, was a, I had a fellowship project. It was with Code for America. We worked with the city of Miami with, and I'm gonna just use an anecdote to kind of like explain sure. or answer that question. Absolutely. Um, uh, and so the project was to address affordable housing. Now that's a very broad term because there's different forms of housing um, and there's different groups of people who need housing. You have the homeless, you have, affordability of rents, you have first time home buyers, people who want to be able to purchase, right? There's all these, and that that's just like the top three that come to mind, but there's just several other layers of like housing that can be addressed that you can create solutions for. Um, and so when we see that umbrella term, you have to understand that you're, the government um, is not necessarily the best innovator. Um, they have the resources to tax you so that they can find innovators to build 
for them. So they contract out, but they themselves don't necessarily have the capacity or the, um, the resources basically, whether it's um, staff, whether it's um, the technology itself to execute on that, right? Um, and, and they I depend think, on yeah, really sorry. everyone else in the market, everybody else in the public. Because they don't necessarily always have the time to do the research to find out what the problem is and how to best execute it. Because again, we said a broad term, affordable housing. Well, in our pro in our approach, um, we received the this mandate to help them solve this problem in like six months, right? Affordable housing is a huge problem. It's a big umbrella term. So then we have to do research and reach out to the community and find out like, what is the current ecosystem like? What does it even look like before we start building anything? So we kind of have to scope it out, figure out who are the players. Um, so basically that, inc that included like reaching out to the nonprofits who are doing work addressing this, whether it's sheltering abuse um, uh, women or runaways or um, the homeless or uh, first time home buyer programs. Um, so just engaging these people who have been working in the space for a long time, trying to address it. And maybe they weren't addressing it using technology, but they're addressing it in other ways that are more connected to the community. Like they're actually having one-on-one -on -one conversations with the community in a regular, on a regular basis. And so once we have those conversations with those stakeholders, we have a more holistic view of what the landscape looks like. And then we can pinpoint a particular area and a particular problem that might easily be, um, there might be a solution that has a technical component into it, in it, that allows us to be maybe that area to be more efficient, more effective, more accurate. Um, and that's what we discovered. And it was just, it was one area that maybe nobody else would have known about, but that a simple solution really kind of like would accelerate the process and allow for a lot more data um, and so on and so forth. Want more inspiration in the palm of your hand? Pick up Nerissa's copy of 31 Days of Yes and have it delivered straight to your device. Get it at beyourownanswer.com slash get 31 days. So how do you then, um, so then it, so I'm, I'm hearing, you know, you really kind of uh, in approaching civic engagement through technology. How do you, in working with a broad government organization that is driven by elections, you know, so like timelines based, like we said, you were going to come up with a solution and there's an election in two years or there's an election in a year. And so we need to move some progress along or all these you know, other kinds of things that could be driving a unrealistic timeline. How mm -hmm. do you manage that? How do you manage you know, having the discussions with them and saying, I know you want a solution for, as you said, housing, but this is what we can, we can do in the timeline that you want us to execute. How, how do you manage that conversation? So, I mean, you definitely have to just be realistic and just be able to articulate that. I think that's like the uh, program managers kind of like um, main thing, setting realistic expectations of what can be delivered. Um, and we definitely had to do that in the middle of that project. Um, you know, initially we thought we would be delivering an actual solid solution that they could out the box and start implementing and we we're testing and people are using. Um, but that just wasn't realistic. In the end, what was the solution that ended up working was just actually mapping out exactly what the city would have to do with its internal resources, what basically instructions on what the internal resources would have to build and exactly how to build it. Because other before then, they didn't know what the problem was. It, they, again, it was just an overarching affordable housing, but we were able to pinpoint a specific department, a specific application process, um, a specific application uh, that they could address um, and exactly how to do that. Um, and But we didn't write a line of code. Uh, because there's also that idea of, 
you know, there's different coding languages. And so if all your internal staff know one language, but I, as an engineer who's doing this research, know another language, I'm not going to be able to build something that you and your team is going to be able to maintain. And so that's where we had to make the decision that, okay, let's not build a solution because it's not going to be something the city can adopt. And again, you can build something, but you need to be able to maintain it for the future. And so it made more sense to give them the, the kind of like that framework that, of what needed to be built, what the actual, what was one problem that they could address, how to build it, and then they can have their internal resources built it in the way that they know, in the language that they prefer that the city can maintain. So it's, so from the very beginning, there is a conversation um, when you're, because I, because we're, we're, we dropped right into a problem and I'm, I'm trying to ask questions to help my audience um, come be here with you, mm-hmm. you know, so to, to make the connection. Yeah. So from the very beginning, when you are working with, you know, with, with all of the, the background that you have and you connect with uh, a government en- entity, a municipality, things like that, to try to help them solve a problem, it sounds like you're leveraging a lot of things, including the data that they already have. So it sounds like you're you're going back to what we were talking about before the international affairs. You're you're leveraging this relationship and and keeping the lines of communication open so that you have the data that you need to see what what solution you know as an entrepreneur you can actually provide in a realistic exactly. scale. Okay, exactly. I, I will add this. So everyone assumes that the, the government has all this data. Mm-hmm. They don't. That's that's what we discovered in the like i would say over the course of that project is that we assume that our governments have all this information but really and if we like go back to even the snowden and all these other cases that have happened they're actually getting that information from the private sector it's the private sector that funnels like i mentioned all that information it's so you have to think about it like your government is not collecting as much data as it should um in some capacity so like for example when we're addressing um, the affordable housing, that one area that we found there was like a, you know, a big hole was when it came to real estate developers who wanted to apply for the impact fee deferrals, like the incentive programs for building affordable housing units, right? And so they have to do an application process. Now the department that does these um, processes, these applications and approves them is a separate department in a different building from the center of innovation. So again, the center of innovation, the pe- the department that actually creates like the tech solutions for the government, they have different government bodies within the county that they're kind of like communicating with and they're responsible for. Um, and so that one office that is um, in control of the incentive programs, that's just I would say one of their clients that they're responsible for creating solutions. And so that goes again to speak to the point that they may not have the resources to dive into every government uh, government agency that communicates with them to craft a solution, unique solution for that department. So it's, it's almost as if each department needs to diagnose what the tech solution is. And they, even within those departments, they're already, they already have programs that they're trying to work on um, and so they're doing it in the in the way that works. They're not really thinking about how to, um, especially when it comes to technology, because that's not their domain, how to make the process more uh, efficient or scalable. And so in this instance, we went to this department and guess what? The application process was paper, um, not, no webs. Yeah, ex- <laughs> you, and, and here's the thing. People are amazed because- What year was this? What year was this? Is this could not 2019. Be like- Okay. Paper application. Okay. Go to the office. Let me tell you, we went to the office. The guy's like, here are all the boxes from the last month that I have to go through. So it's paper applications to submit in order for these real estate developers to get approved to provide affordable housing units. Yeah, that's horrible. It doesn't make sense. So, and you have one... You have an individual no who has to that. go through all these applications no, no and approve them. And, 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 and I mean, I mean he does it. He does do it. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I mean, but, as far as the real estate developers, I mean, unless you have. And I, exactly. Right, so I, yeah. So it's like, even though there's this incentive, 
the process is too cumbersome even yeah. for them to want to go through all that effort. Does it make sense? And so, um, so we maybe decided, a solution. Okay. So it sounds like even yeah. in just observing, even in just gathering data. So I hope my hoping my audience is hearing that we're we're going back to the conversation of solutions and solving problems. It may just be just walking yourself through your process. Where is it that someone is sticking? So where is it that that you are preventing someone from interacting and engaging with you in as smooth a process as possible? A paper trail in 2019, um, even before COVID, because I know now um, every place that I go, there's, there's paper. So a paper trail in 2019 for a real estate developer, because um, I, I, I help people uh, submit responses to RFPs and those things are like 100 pages. So the fact that that would have to be, I remember we, we'd submit them, but we'd submit them in hard drives. We'd submit them in flash drives and then we'd give a paper copy, but that was just a backup in case the hard drive didn't work, right? So, so the fact that that would be the primary way to interact and engage, um, that has to be exhausting for the person who has to read them as well as for um, blocking potential people for, uh, yeah, yeah. So just, just, yeah. And that, that's the part where it's like, even if you wanted to collect data, now this is about even creating a, now we have to create a database based on this information. And so <laughs> like, it wasn't uh, necessarily like a big discovery, but what we had to do was exactly what you said. We had to go to every department, every agency <laughs> or every nonprofit that is dealing with this problem and walk through their process. That was the conversation. I'll, I'll go into an office and be like, so tell me what your process is. Like mm -hmm. when someone has a housing issue, how do they engage? with you what's step one how to get how do you seven? get that kind of so so how do you get that kind of buy-in with the government agency that you as an independent contractor as an engineer are going to walk into all of their offices well how is how is that buy-in gotten so i would say that buy-in is um so specifically with like our project at code for america it's really so we talked about civic engagement and that really what was what it was so um there's this contact concept of civic tech and so it's basically marries that idea of civic engagement but then we utilize tech um as our form of executing on that engagement and so you have like a, a quote like i'm part of a brigade called code for south florida it's loosely tied to code for america there's brigades all over the nation so you'll have a code for austin code for um buffalo and so it these are organization, nonprofit organizations that just bring in local technologists and just passionate people. You don't have to be a coder or anything like that, but people who want to figure out how to utilize technology to solve or um, make better kind of like digital solutions to the problems that are in their community that government and nonprofits are involved in trying to solve. And so through that organization and like my involvement, then I got the opportunity to work on this fellowship project. And our the um, Mike Sorosti, who was the uh, chief innovation officer at the city of Miami, who brought in this project, um, he had engaged with Code for South and the work that we were doing in the community. So a lot of times the civic projects, they don't get picked up automatically by your city. Um, you know, so like he, he, Mike Rossi was familiar with the Code for America network, with our brigade. We do projects without having a mandate necessarily to do it. And so those and those projects a lot of times can be very successful during covid we did a um kind of like a covid tracker again it's you find a resource we find um data that tells us about the spread of um covid or lo locations for uh you know testing and you just spin up a website like that's civic tech because you're not you're not doing it because you're creating a business model but there's a need there's a social need in the community and so that's kind of like our approach to civic tech we try and find where is this, a lot of times there's open source data that's available, um, or you can create like a database. Yeah, And so it's a lot of hacking and we say hacking, not in the sense of breaking into something, but in the sense of um, thinking creatively about where to find the information and how to pull it into a page where it, we can vis visually present it to an audience where they're receiving information that they can make a decision on. 
Hey, this is a great episode, right? Want to carry the insights from our show with you wherever you go? Visit myjoyisvaluable.com for the best resources we've gathered that are inspired by our expert guests. Find support for your business, tools to organize your life, and more. That's myjoyisvaluable.com. So the hacking, and I, I like the term, I like the term hacking because, you know, it's, it's come to mean um, breaking apart things so that they work better, right? So I, I like that, that, you know, there, there are places where there's open source and, and open source data. How do you know the integrity of that data? So that is something that you always have to consider. Um, uh, I have actually someone on my team. Um, for one of the projects I work for, and she's a data scientist. Um, you want to, like, again, with civic tech, it's a collaboration of technologists. So, again, no, not everyone has to be a software engineer, but you could have a data scientist on there. It's it's not necessarily that you're going to always produce with civic tech something that is 100% infallible and perfect, but it gives you the initial piece of data that you need. Whether or not that data is completely clean, unless you have someone who's volunteering, who happens to be the data scientist who volunteered on that particular project to make sure that that's the case, you know, that might be an area where it falls. Um, it, it may have like that uh, failability, like, right? Um, but again, the idea is with open source technology is to take that first step to a solution. And by the time a city says, okay, this has been successful up to X, Y, Z point, we can adopt this and improve it because they see that it meets a need and it's actually working. And I think that's the great strength of open source is that it allows people to get a start in crafting the solution um, that the government doesn't have the resources to look into. And then if it has enough success, even if it's not perfect in the beginning, they can adopt it and make it better um, and at a lower cost than necessarily going to like um, a contractor um, and whatnot. So let's talk a little bit about, and then we'll, we'll wrap. Um, let's talk a little bit about the next generation, right? So what you're talking about in serving the community right, is, is opening up the problems that are, that the government does want to solve, but may not have the, the wherewithal, the capacity, um, or the data to solve. So we have, um, I'm, I'm an educator by trade, right, and so I have all of my students, my high schoolers, who are seeing real-time problems that they want to solve and they've got the heart and the passion for it. Um, we get them through these great industry certification tracks, right? Mm -hmm. And then now, how do we then take that passion that they have to solve those real-time problems that you just talked about and then get them to the spaces where they can be on a team to solve them? Like what, what are the, the skills that they need um, what are the ways that I can get, I mean, like I said, at, at, particularly at, at my school, which is a public school, um, we, the kids are graduating with these amazing engineering certifications, coding certifications, all this other kind of stuff. But I want to see them take that abstract knowledge and that nice piece of paper and put it to something that really makes them feel like they're making a difference. How do we make those connections? That's a really great question. And it, actually I was having a conversation yesterday. Um, and this is just something I think when we think about like career development, um, a lot of times we think, okay, we got the certifications. And so I can start building the, the solution um, at a company right away. But there is, I feel like definitely has to be a space in between where you are working on that project or working on that solution regardless, right? That means it's a per, if it's like a, and maybe it's part of my entrepreneurial background, but I think a lot of the people that I've seen be really successful in the tech space have demonstrated this ability, like a self-starter um, mentality where there's a problem and they create solutions, not because they were hired to do it, but because they were so passionate about it. And so the places where I feel like you can find um, 
people to kind of like collaborate with you. I think that is definitely a skill, the ability to collaborate with someone. Um, I think that's the power of the internet. There, it's, it's a space for collaboration. I remember when, and I come from like an unconventional like coding background. So I did a boot camp. Um, I remember when I f was first like coding my first job, um, I had like, I had a coding issue. The, the actual first thing I did was go on Twitter to black tech Twitter and say, hey guys, I'm running into this error uh what do you get who here can help me someone jumped on a zoom with me the next day and helped me hack figure out a solution and that's what i feel like is the nature of tech or at least when we think about all the great the big companies that have sprouted out it's technologists or people who've come together through the internet or through their passion for a certain problem and they built something or they solved something and it's that ability to look for like that com commonality um, and just like, just hack away, find a solution that I think really is the thing that we need to, once they get their certifications, we need to be able to instill in them this desire to just start building, not necessarily wait for someone to give you permission to build, but to just reach out, start building. If you run into a problem, reach out to, let's say someone who might be able to guide you in that direction. And I think that's where open source technology, like that ecosystem is very much oriented in that way. Um, and um, civic tech is oriented in that way. That's helpful because uh, the, 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 the two things that we're balancing there is also just, just go build it, which is great. Um, and then the other thing, and, and I guess we'll have to figure that out for ourselves. We have also students who are excited to get into tech and coding and things like that just because of their heart but then also we have them who are resource poor so um you know for them they may want to just you know they, even though they want to build it they don't have the resources to to spend the time like they'd rather just get into the job market and because they got to feed their families or they got to feed themselves so i think um maybe what what's helpful for us is to as an institution maybe reach out to you know, you all and start getting them building while they're in school so that, you know, so that because once they leave school, you know, it's always the family pressures. It's always the economic, pre let's be completely real, real, the economic pressures. So, yeah, so I hopefully, agree. you know, we, we, we can, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, you're working with your organizations to reach out and, and, and connect with their, Again, they're passionate. They want to be out there. They they want to do the work. So, so wrapping up, um, what are some projects right now that you're ex or what is one project right now that you're you're excited about, and how can we reach out to you? Um, the project that I'm primarily excited about um, is it kind of delves into what you were speaking about how to like get people together, especially early career into building projects, right? Um, so Haitians in Tech is an initiative I, initiative I launched last year. Um, and we've partnered up with Code for South Florida, the civic tech organization down here. Um, and we basically fit under like two pillars, um, like that diversity uh, aspect of it, of a minority community and getting them involved in the civic solutions that their government and local nonprofits want to implement. Um, so we want to bring in talent and especially if they're early career and then introduce them to the idea of um, working on civic tech problems. And I think that's a good marrying of things uh, of like they're they're in the beginning of their career, but they're also building solutions specifically for their community. Um, and so the way that we're looking to implement that is not just like by providing them resources to upskill themselves and get themselves into like, you know, career ready position, but also by creating like these hackathons where we can create like this formula of specific projects that are around oriented around the problems in their community. Um, so again, like the example with the affordable housing, um, if we're looking at affordable housing in Little Haiti, which is a big thing, especially as it gets gentrified, right? Um, that's something they can understand and like they can speak to because they are of Haitian um, descent, uh, of an immigrant um, background. So they understand, you know, what that community is going through. And they can, if we host a hackathon, build then a solution that speaks to that experience a lot better than you know, uh, Joe Schmo, who has no idea 
where Haiti is, if it's in the Caribbean or South America for that matter. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so, um, so thank you so much for your time. Um, we look forward to seeing what, what evolves and what comes out of it. And um, we're excited for the work that you're doing and uh, look forward to what's next. I look forward to as well. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, I hope you have everyone in the audience. If you have any questions or concerns in regards to like how you can bring civic tech to your community, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to share that information about the civic innovation framework and how you can help implement it, implement it wherever you reside. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Be Your Own Answer podcast. Share this episode with someone who needs it. Find us at beyourownanswer.com. Oh,